Well, if the general who commanded Donald Trump's army gets 22 years in federal prison for what he did on January 6th, what does the commander in chief of Donald Trump's army get if he is found guilty? That is the question that Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers are thinking about tonight with the breaking news that the leader of the so-called Proud Boys was sentenced to 22 years for his leadership of what prosecutors called Donald Trump's army on January 6th. When Enrique Tarrio completes his 22-year sentence, he will be one year away from eligibility for Social Security retirement benefits unless Republicans have raised the retirement age in the meantime. But the 39-year-old Enrico, Enrique Tario will not be earning any Social Security credits while in prison, and he can be absolutely sure Donald Trump won't be around to help out when Enrique Tario gets out of prison. Today, Cuban-American Enrique Tario from Florida got the longest sentence ever given to someone who committed crimes for the President of the United States. Two of the five men convicted in the 1972 Watergate burglary to help President Richard Nixon were right-wing Cuban-Americans like Enrique Tarrio. They were sentenced to one to four years and served 13 months and 15 months. Enrique Tarrio has already served more prison time than that in his criminal past. He served 16 months in federal prison beginning in 2013. After that, he became an informer, helping investigators prosecute his former associates. associates. Tonight, if there's anyone out there still foolishly calling himself a proud boy who has not yet been accused of crimes, don't be surprised if Enrique, Enrique Tario testifies against you someday in the hope of reducing his 22-year sentence. Prosecutors ask for enhancements to Tario's sentence, including a terrorism enhancement that they told the judge meant that Tario should be sentenced to 33 years in prison. Judge Timothy Kelly recognized the technical applicability of the terrorism enhancement, but Judge Kelly decided not to add that to the sentence. Judge Kelly served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia for 10 years. He then worked as a litigator in a major Washington law firm. He decided to become a member of the Federalist Society 12 years after graduating from law school. And then he had the easiest possible ride to confirmation as a federal judge after serving on the staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee as a counsel to Republican chairman of the committee, Chuck Grassley. Chairman Grassley got Tim Kelly nominated as a federal judge in the fourth month of the Trump presidency. His confirmation sailed through the Judiciary Committee with a unanimous vote and got 94 votes on the Senate floor. Judge Kelly had to know that if Donald Trump were to win the next presidential election, Judge Kelly would have absolutely no chance of being elevated by Donald Trump to the Circuit Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court after issuing a 22-year sentence to the leader of Donald Trump's army. No future Republican president is likely to reward Judge Kelly with a promotion. And so, in a sense, Judge Kelly also sentenced himself today to a career as a federal district judge who will probably never be promoted. In fact, most federal district judges are never promoted. There simply aren't enough appeals court openings to ever allow for that. And very few federal judges ever have to make a decision that they know will end even the theoretical possibility of being promoted. Judge Kelly did that today. You can spend a lifetime in the federal courts and never see that happen. But this is the age of Trump, full of things we've never seen before. Also today, there was a mystery filing by Special Prosecutor Jack Smith in the case of United States of America versus Donald Trump. The motion could not say publicly what it is actually about, quote, because the motion refers to sensitive materials. Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers 
opposed Jack Smith's motion. Jack Smith's motion says that the Trump lawyers were trying to, quote, grind litigation in this case to a halt, which is particularly infeasible given the pressing matters before the court, including the defendant's daily extrajudicial statements that threaten to prejudice the jury pool in this case as described in the government's motion. So we do now know that the motion that we have not been allowed to see does contain sensitive materials and a description of, quote, the defendant's daily extrajudicial statements that threaten to prejudice the jury pool in this case. Judge Tanya Chutkin gave the defense lawyers a deadline of Monday, September 11th, to file a secret motion in opposition and gave Jack Smith a deadline of September 13th to file his response secretly to the defendant's secret motion. Tomorrow at 1 p.m., we might learn a lot publicly, a lot about how the Georgia prosecution of Donald Trump and his 18 co-defendants might eventually be organized. The Georgia judge assigned to the case, Scott McAfee, will hold a hearing at 1 p.m. tomorrow on the motions by two co-defendants to sever, sever their cases from the rest of the defendants. The two co-defendants seeking to sever their cases are attorney Kenneth Cheesebro and attorney Sidney Powell. In a notice to both sides in the case, Judge McAfee wrote that he intends to ask District Attorney Fawny Willis to provide, quote, a good faith estimate of the time reasonably anticipated to present the state's case during a joint trial of all 19 co-defendants and alternatively, any divisions thereof, including the number of witnesses likely to be called and the number and size of exhibits likely to be introduced. Thanks to testimony about him to the January 6th committee, there was already plenty of reason to think as his co-workers testified that they did, that Jeffrey Clark was crazy. But because Neil Katyal went to the Burning Man Festival this year for the first time, we have discovered that indicted Trump co-conspirator Jeffrey Clark is even crazier than we thought. Before he attacked Neil Katyal on Twitter for attending what he called a neo-pagan ritual. It turns out Neil Katyal picked the single most difficult year to attend the Burning Man Festival held annually at the end of August in the Nevada desert, desert, which is already one of the hottest places in the world. But this weekend, the Burning Man location in the desert got swamped by a stunning desert rainfall that created impassable conditions for vehicles in or out of Burning Man. Neil Katyal was one of the people who got out of Burning Man and tweeted very helpful advice to others who were trying to leave Burning Man, beginning with this tweet. It was an incredibly harrowing six-mile hike at midnight through heavy and slippery mud, but I got safely out of Burning Man, never been before, and it was fantastic with brilliant art and fabulous music, except the ending. I was not surprised that Neil Katyal was at Burning Man because he is the coolest former acting Solicitor General that the Justice Department has ever had. And I know he would have been at Woodstock, which unfortunately for Neil occurred a year before he was born. I wasn't the only one who wasn't surprised. The single strangest person among Donald Trump's 18 co-defendants in Georgia is Jeffrey Clark the then obscure Justice Department official who Donald Trump made the acting attorney general for a few hours before changing his mind after every top Justice Department official threatened to resign. Jeffrey Clark urged the then acting attorney general to lie to Georgia state officials and claim that the Justice Department had evidence of election fraud in Georgia. Everyone who has ever worked at the Justice Department or has any working knowledge of it was shocked beyond words and sickened by what Jeffrey Clark tried to do to overturn the presidential election from his position in the Justice Department. That same Jeffrey Clark tweeted this reaction to Neil Katyal's tweet about Burning Man. Why am I not surprised that Neil Katyal made it 
a priority to get to a neo-pagan ritual. Pray that these folks come to the light and realize that the only path is through and to our Lord. We are all fallen and need God and to repent as a nation. None of us have fallen as far as Jeffrey Clark has fallen. And if Defendant Clark is convicted, a judge will decide exactly how long and exactly where Defendant Clark will repent. Neil Katyal is back with us and safely back from Burning Man. Uh, Neil, uh, you have the floor. Uh, Neo-pagan ritual um, from a, an attack from Jeffrey Clark is uh, is quite remarkable. Uh, but please, uh, we are willing to hear your defense if you have one. Well, first of all, I think Jeff Clark was a key participant, Lawrence, in one of the most neo-pagan rituals of all, which is <laughs> worshiping Donald Trump. And you'd think that's a guy who's simultaneously facing disbarment, state criminal charges, and the possibility of additional federal charges might have something better to do than to troll people, and frankly, to troll people poorly online. And um, I, I guess, uh, you know, in a way I feel for him, he's under an enormous strain of criminal indictment. And if I could advise him, I'd say, look, you're in a hole, stop digging. But I realize that's kind of futile because that's the kind of behavior that landed him in jail in Georgia in the first place. Um, and, you know, part of me just thinks Jeffrey Clark is upset that he couldn't attend Burning Man himself because he's too busy turning himself into the Fulton County Jail. Um, but on a more serious note, um, I've heard this garbage my whole life, Lawrence. Go home, go back to where you came from, pray to the one true God, Lord, that kind of stuff. Um, and I've also seen the other side of that. I've, I went to a Catholic school in Chicago where I never heard that kind of garbage there, a place where people respected my faith and respected other faiths. And when I was at the Justice Department, that was certainly the mission of the department for everyone there. I remember, like, for example, the Westboro Church came in to talk to us. They had a Supreme Court case, and that was a religion about as far away from mine as one could imagine. But we listened to them respectfully. We gave them their time, um, and we took what they said seri as seriously as, you know, the arguments warranted. Mm -hmm. We didn't do this kind of stuff. And, you know, this guy is not just a constitutional menace, um, he's also a criminal. And, you know, at the end of this, I guess I'd invite Mr. Clark to attend Burning Man next year to see what it's about. But I have a strong suspicion that he might not be allowed to leave the state of Georgia by next summer. Uh, Neil Katyal, well, thank you for two things, the report from Burning Man and that thing about put the plastic bags on your sock before you put the socks on for marching out, all those helpful details, but also for revealing to me something I did not know, which is Jeffrey Clark is on Twitter. Like most people on Twitter, I had no idea, uh, but now I'm a faithful follower. Well, you probably don't, Lawrence, because the guy blocks everyone. The minute that I, you know, I responded to him, he blocked me and started tweeting all this stuff at me, which I haven't been able to read yet. So, all right, I got to you know, I, I got to check. If, I got to check if I'm blocked because I did follow him yesterday. As soon as I saw this Twitter madness from him, uh, Neil Katyal, thank you very much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate it, and uh, I hope you can. Yeah, I hope you can provoke more out of Defendant Clark. Thank you so much, Lance. Thank you, Neil. Senator, uh, here we have it, uh, finally, an actual ethics complaint uh, filed against Justice Alito. Uh, what, what brought you to this point? Well, two things. First of all, I sit on the Judiciary Committee and the one thing that we hear every single time that we have a uh, confirmation hearing for a Supreme Court justice is they refuse to answer a question because they say it would be improper or unethical to opine about a matter that might come before the court. So we have every Supreme Court justice on record, including Justice Alito, saying that. And then the next thing you know, there he is. Uh, talking to a lawyer on the Wall Street Journal editorial page and opining on a matter that might well come before the Supreme Court. 
So the first thing about this is that that element of it is a pretty flagrant violation of a ethics tenet that all of the judges have subscribed to publicly in their confirmation hearings. And the second thing is that went from that to way, way worse as we began to find out, okay, this wasn't just general opining. This was opining in relation to a specific dispute that the interviewer was the lawyer in that dispute, that the client of the interviewer lawyer in that dispute was Justice Alito's friend and the you know sort of infamous court fixer, Leonard Leo, and that the information we were seeking, the gravamen of the investigation, was gifts arranged by Leo to Alito. So there's a lot of fact-finding that needs to be done to flesh out those remaining segments, and that's what made this very interesting to me, because you had a clear violation by Justice Alito, so it'll be hard for the court or the judicial conference to just shrug this off, and you have a clear interest in further fact-finding, which is the thing that the court has gone out of its way to avoid having any of. I, I just want to, you know, give the audience a, a sense of just how much constitutional law you have to know to know how wrong his statement is. Uh, and, and that is, of course, that there are nine Supreme Court justices because Congress decided it would be nine. Uh, it had been other numbers at other points in time. I, I'm not aware of any Supreme Court justice in history, including the very first Supreme Court justices, having the slightest doubt that Congress gets to decide how many Supreme Court justices there are, which is to say Congress does get to regulate the Supreme Court. Indeed, not only as to its number, but as to its jurisdiction, uh, mm -hmm. its appellate jurisdiction. And indeed, the letter that I wrote to Chief Justice Roberts received by him also in his capacity as the chair of the Judicial Conference, that's a job he has by virtue of Congress. The Judicial, con con the judicial Conference is a body established by Congress. So the idea that none of this has any relation to Congress just has no merit at all. But it's the argument that is being used uh, by the billionaires and now by Justice Alito to try to handicap our investigation into what the facts are, into when there were gifts and how many gifts were there, and what was the scenario in which the gifts were developed, who was the orchestrator of getting them the gifts, all of those things merit investigation. And it's that investigation that this, uh, the Republicans love to use the word weaponized, this weaponized uh, opinion of uh, Justice Alito is being used uh, to discourage or uh, defeat. You know, when I read uh, his comments in that interview, I, I immediately recognized that it was nutty, but I had no idea that it could fit into uh, this description of a violation of ethics, which is on several different points that, that you raised. That I, 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 and so it, it's really a, a stunning uh, document that you've created here, including that passage from uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch in his confirmation hearing, where he refuses to answer a question about the possibility of such a bill existing. You've actually passed the legislation through the Judiciary Committee. It's real legislation. It's moving. And it obviously would someday move to some kind of decision by the Supreme Court, possibly. Uh, and there's uh, Samuel Alito talking about it when Judge Gorsuch said he couldn't even talk about the theoretical possibility of someone passing legislation like that. Yeah, the... Uh... Gorsuch quote is particularly telling because it's not just saying I can't generally offer an opinion on any matter that might come before the court. He's specifically saying I cannot offer an opinion on the prospect of ethics legislation being done by Congress because that would come before the court. So it would be wrong for me to offer an opinion. And you put that side by side with Alito opining merrily away in the Wall Street Journal editorial pages of all places to a lawyer in the dispute of all people, and it gets pretty ripe. 